Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And we're very glad that you could join us for the latest in our continuing and nonstop series of virtual programs from the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, today, it is our virtual curator spotlight starting nine. We will look at two artifacts apiece for each team in the American League Central. Uh, before we get started, though, with our guests, we want to remind you that all these programs, including these Curator Spotlights, are made possible through the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. And we thank Ford Motor for paying the bills and making these events possible throughout 2001. Uh, joining us today to help us through this land of artifacts is John O'Dell. Curator of History and Research. It's been a few months since we touched base with John. John, how you doing? Doing fine, Bruce. Doing fine. We've got more snow falling here in Cooperstown. We've got about, what, 16, 18 inches on the ground and, uh, and more coming down. So if you uh, are in the north, it's definitely wintertime. And nobody's thinking yet about uh, pitchers and catchers returning whenever it is that they're going to return. We don't know that yet, do we, uh, for, uh, for spring training. But uh, it, it's going to be coming soon. It's going to be coming soon. Yeah. And hard to believe 20 days, it'll be March. So spring is around the corner, even though the snow, as you say, does continue to fall here in central New York. Today, John, our focus will be on the five teams located in the American League's central division. We'll do them in alphabetical order uh, by city name. So we will begin in the Windy City with the Chicago White Sox franchise. And we'll start here with something that's a little bit off the beaten path uh, of artifacts. This is not right. obviously a bat or a ball or a glove or a helmet or a jersey. Uh, this is a piece of championship jewelry. It is not a ring, though. It is something called a fob, F-O-B. Yeah. And I've heard that term many times. I think I know what a fob is. But, John, if you would explain it for me a little better. Sure, it's it's a um, it's a uh, a charm uh, ornament uh, that would have been connected to your pocket watch. So uh, wrist watches really didn't gain any popularity until uh, World War One, um, and so before then, everybody, if you were wearing a watch, you had a pocket watch, and if you were particularly stylish, you'd be uh, have a uh, a little chain that would go from one side or over your button. And then the, the pocket, uh, the, the watch would be in the other pocket of your vest. Uh, and the opportunity to show off just a little bit uh, is what the, the watch fob or charm was for. We call it a fob here. Um, uh, but sometimes I've also seen the language saying that this is the, uh, the championship charm mm. that the, uh, that the Nahims would get. One of the things that's really neat is that uh, in the very early years uh, these uh, had different, the, the uh, charms were different for every team. They looked very different. This is one of my favorites because you get uh, the, the red, white, and blue enameling, uh, the, the uh, 14 karat gold there, the nice diamond uh, up at the very top. You see the, uh, the, the white sock uh, right there for the yeah. world champions white socks. This was uh, owned actually by a fellow named Nick Al uh, Althrock who was a longtime baseball fella, who was uh, first a player and then a baseball clown. He was a coach. He was in baseball uh, actively and being paid to be in baseball for over 50 years. So he was uh, just a real baseball lifer. Um, now this this is was, uh, af after the uh, series, th this was designed, um, and uh, Comiskey actually wanted cufflinks uh, for the players. Uh, nothing had been set in stone yet about what you were supposed to have. So uh, everybody had been getting charms. Uh, Comiskey wanted to shake it up and the, and the uh, player said, no, they don't want cufflinks because uh, when it's, you know, when you're wearing your jacket, you can't see the cufflinks. So uh, they said, no, we want the watch fob. I see. Okay. Now this is early history. This is 1906. That's right. So you're talking about the World Series still in its um, uh, very much uh, infant stages at this right. point in time. Certainly. The tradition of rings would come about decades later. Yes. Uh, 1922, we would start to see a little bit of a change as they move away from fobs and other jewelry. And who was the team that made that change? The, the Giants were the first team to uh, fashion a world championship ring, uh, Bruce. They uh, 
uh, won in 1921 and got a, uh, a very beautiful um, watch fob. Uh, and then in 1922, having uh, de repeating, they decided that they wanted to have a ring uh, that year. And so that's the first year with rings. And then there's about a decade in which you have rings, watch fobs, wrist watches, pocket watches, tie bars, even uh, the um, 1930 uh, Philadelphia Athletics have a tie bar. They're the last team that has something other than a ring. And then the uh, Gas House Cardinals get a ring in 1931, and then everybody since then has gotten a ring. John, looking at the design of this, is that supposed to be a globe in the middle? That is, that's exactly right, because this is the World Series. So that's a globe with the latitude and longitude uh, lines cut engraved uh, in it. Um, and uh, the, the winged um, uh, shoe of Mercury uh, there to uh, talk about how the, the, the uh, the White Sox and, and how fast they were. Uh, they won the, this was an all Chicago World Series. This was uh, the, the White Sox and Cubs. Um, the, uh, the White Sox ended up uh, winning four games to two. Now, John, you said it was donated by Nick Altrock or it yes. was once in his possession. Do we know when the rings were given out? The tradition today is to do them opening day the following year. Right. Was that similar back then? Uh, it, it varied. Um, actually, there were many, many years in which the, um, uh, the jewelry was simply mailed in the off season uh, to the players and they would receive it at home and there was no ceremony. Uh, I don't know when the um, ceremony began uh, of when players started receiving um, the items at their, at their home opener. Um, and I don't know how this one was distributed, uh, whether this was whether there was a certain day uh, when this was sent out or if it was just mailed out to everybody. I mean, actually, now, the I owner of the out. White Sox, Charles Comiskey, had a reputation for not necessarily being the most willing to spend money. I don't know how fair that is. Uh, some have say right. that prompted um, the Black Sox scandal, and that's a whole other story. Uh, but this particular item, this watch fob, this looks like a very nice piece of jewelry. This does not look like something inexpensive. No, the um, uh, even at this time, Major League Baseball was providing uh, money for the um, for the World Championship jewelry, and so uh, the, this cost uh, at that time about sixteen hundred. Uh, sorry, six hundred dollars, um, which is uh, would have been. Uh, Estimated at about four thousand now, um, for whatever that's worth. Uh, I I'll be honest with you. I think this looks uh, this looks a lot better than some of the the gaudy rings that are being yeah. produced nowadays. Um, there's definitely uh, I think a, uh, more just uh, more beauty that that's yeah. in here instead of just jamming in uh, yet another diamond chip. Now, we play a little game with this. We try to figure out, or I try to figure out, where these artifacts are located. This one, I'm going to guess, and I think this one's pretty easy, yeah. is that it's up in Autumn Glory on the third floor, and it's in the case with the rings and the pendants and the other watch fobs. That's right. That's right. That's exactly where this is. Uh, we uh, pride ourselves in having almost all of the um, – uh, examples of, of the uh, World Series jewelry, some of those from the, the very early decades before we were established, we don't have. Uh, so if anybody's got some uh, that, uh, that predate uh, 1921, we're always interested uh, in hearing uh, from them. We have uh, donated to us um, uh, the beginning in 1921, which is uh, not coincidentally, the year that Kennesaw Mountain Landis became commissioner because he donated um, quite a few uh, of the of the championship uh, emblems, as they're sometimes called, the championship emblems. And that tradition of the commissioner donating these items, that continues, correct? Continues today. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, an extra, uh, the commissioner gets one, uh, but an extra one is made for the commissioner to donate to the Baseball Hall of Fame. And so, uh, the commissioner gets to, to wear whatever ring he wants to, I suppose. I yeah. uh, would imagine if I were the commissioner, I'd probably shy away from wearing uh, a, a World Series ring for fear of looking like you were um, uh, 
uh, favoring w- one team or the other. But uh, but then we get one uh, shortly after the uh, rings are distributed in the springtime, and uh, and we'll be looking for a new one uh, coming up this spring. All right, very nice. Our second artifact from the Chicago White Sox is something very different, also a different time period. This is from 1976, when the right. ever innovative owner Bill Veck decided that he was going to try something different in terms of baseball uniforms. We had never seen this before in the major leagues, but it did have precedent in the minor leagues. Tell us about this, John. Yeah, so these are uh, uh, a pair of uh, a shirt and a pair of shorts, and it's tough to tell on this particular image that, that these are shorts. So, Bruce, will you move us forward one slide? I think we've got an image of this. There we go with Ralph Gar and Minnie Mignoso. Uh, you can see the Chicago uh, White Sox wearing their shorts and white socks. Uh, the the uh, Pacific Coast League Hollywood stars had worn shorts uh, back in the 1950s, 50 to 53. Uh, and in spring training in February, um, uh, Bill Beck said, I'm going to break out. These are these are auxiliaries um, uniform that, that we're going to break out uh, and sometime this year. And then he waited until August uh, before he uh, before he brought them out. And um, uh, I have a, a quote from uh, Goose Gossage saying, well, I've got pretty good looking legs, but I don't know about the rest of the guys. Uh, so uh, but anyway, uh, the thing that, of course, Anybody looking at this who has played uh, softball in shorts knows or has seen the uh, the movie League of Their Own knows that, you know, you can get uh, strawberries uh, from these. Um, but in the very first game, the um, uh, the Chicago White Sox stole five bases. This is the first game that they wore. They wore it three three different times in August. So they scored. They stole five bases and, and defeated the Royals five to two. And that was a double header for the second game of the double header. They went back to their regular uh, uniform with the uh, with the long pants, and then they ended up losing. But they won their first two games wearing uh, this outfit, and then lost their third game. And uh, this was, and then that was that marked the end of it. But uh, before I move on, I have to say that you know Bill Veck um, is one of the the, the great owners in, um, in in baseball history. So uh, you'll remember that uh, in the 1940s when he owned. The, uh, the the Cleveland Indians. Um, he he broke the American League color barrier by bringing on uh, uh, Larry Doby and then uh, Satchel Paige to go on and, and win the World Series. And then when he uh, moved over, he became the owner of the St. Louis Browns. Uh, he worked very hard and, and uh, actually owned the stadium that both the Browns and the Cardinals played in, and uh, was trying very hard to to get to the point where the, the Browns were seriously uh, considered um, as, an, as an important uh, organization and, you know, as an important baseball organization. But he also did some fun things while he was there. That's where he had, uh, you know, the grandstand manager's night where you would help hold up a sign saying, you know, whether you thought they ought to slide, you know, uh, steal a base or uh, walk the batter. Um, he sent the little person, Eddie Goodell, up. Uh, and then when he came to Chicago, these kinds of uniforms. He put the uh, the exploding scoreboard in. So uh, Bill Beck was uh, one of the uh, unique characters in baseball, but he was really always looking out for the fan uh, and the fan experience in ways that are just um, uh, unusual and, and meritorious. And he belongs in the Hall of Fame. I'm glad he's there. Yeah. yeah. You know, you look at Ralph Gar and I think he actually, you know, he looks pretty good. He's got the legs for this. Oh uh, yeah. I'm not sure yeah. about the coaches and the manager. I'm not sure about some of the heftier players like Jim Spencer. They may not have had the legs for this. Now, my understanding though is that most of the players on the White Sox hated the shorts. Yeah. And that's why they ditched him after three games. Is that your understanding? That's my that- understanding too. Is that the, you know, uh they had to go along with ownership for a little bit. Uh Bill got his um, his promo in that, you know, uh, he'd come up with this. Um, but uh, after that, it was um, it was downhill. The players didn't like playing, you know, even though you'd think, oh, you know, the idea that that Vec had was, well, in, you know, when it's 90 degrees, um, you, you want to uh, have have, you know, be a little bit cooler. But uh, it was not to be. Um, I do have here, hold on for just a second. I, I got a, a, a great quote from um, uh, from his uh, 
from Bilvek's wife. Um, uh, she said, uh, it's like, um, they're not garish. They have an understated elegance is what, <laughs> it's like, and, and it's hard for me to, to, to find much understatement here in this, this yeah. particular, uh, particular uniform. You know, it's one of those two. Uh, there were a few uniforms. This is one, uh, the original, uh, or not the original, but the, the Astros Tequila Sunrise uh, Uni is another that uh, really um, people love to see. And, and they have a, uh, an impact uh, in our imaginations far greater than, um, uh, than a lot of others. Yeah. Now, for some of our younger viewers, they might look at these shorts and say, you know, wow, those are really short. That's the way men wore them back in the 70s. Uh, the, the baggier look that we started to see, I guess Michael Jordan was one of the people that popularized that in the NBA. Um, we would start to see the baggier um, looser shorts in the in the 90s and even to today. And I guess now it's come back a little bit. Now it's more of a compromise. I could see somebody doing this again if they made the shorts a little longer, maybe down to the knees. But there's no way they're going to go back to this. No. Yeah. All right. So where are you going to say this is, Bruce? All right. I think I know because I've seen this recently. This is in one of our newer exhibits called Whole New Ball Game. Yeah. And it's up on the second floor. That's exactly right. Yeah. You betcha. And again, to look at the what it looks like in the exhibit, not only do we have the shorts, we also have the old style jersey with the big collar. Yeah. And the fancy lettering, uh, kind of a 19th century style lettering there. Yeah. And that was all part of the White Sox. Look, they had a white jersey and they also had, I guess, a, a very dark blue jersey yep. uh, that they wore. With the with the short pants, they wore the white jersey. A very memorable look for the socks. Yeah, and those are some but, severe uh, leisure suit collars, there, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> I might still have one or two in the car. <laughs> we'll have to take a look. We'll have to check on that. So that's the White Sox. Let's now yeah. move on to the Cleveland Indians. I love baseball cards. This is a great one. Yeah, this, this is, is great. The 1933 Gaudi baseball card. It's part of a set that Gowdy put out, over 200 players, but there's right. something strange. There is yeah, no so, the, so there were um, uh, 200 players. The, the cards were all numbered, so you would, know, uh, you would know which ones you had. You know how many you had to go for. Um, but uh, there was no card 106. Mm -hmm. And so uh, like people were... And, and it is unknown today. There's no documentation at all today left uh, as to whether that was um, done on purpose in order to drive people to buy them, whether it was uh, there was some problem um, with uh, with signing uh, Lajue. But it, it's uh, it's clear from the from correspondence that he was supposed he would have been this 106 back in 1933, but he wasn't, he wasn't included then on it. And so if you wrote in, now this was the key, you had, it was not distributed in, uh, in 1934. It, you had to write in uh, a, a letter saying, hey, where is this 106? And then uh, presumably some other people found out, oh, you just have to request it. And so you would write in and they would mail you one. Uh, and so that was how they were distributed. Um, most of the cards at, that are out there, uh, or many of them at least, still have uh, the paper clip mark on them where they were paper clipped to the letter that you got back in the mail saying, you asked for it, you got it, uh, here it is. Now, the, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that the card is, um, is a hybrid uh, of the 1932 and 1933, sorry, the 1933 and 34 styles. So uh, in 1933, across the bottom, it said uh, a big, you know, on a red banner, it said big league uh, bubble gum. In 34, there was kind of a diagonal blue banner that went across that said Lou Gehrig says or Chuck Klein says, and then there would be on the back a little tidbit about baseball. Uh, but so, and the uh, 1933 um, banner, big league bubble, oh, sorry, uh, Gowdy's had no little, uh, you see this, the little uh, sketch that's in the background. That was unique to the 34s. Uh, in the 1933, it was just a plain background. So it's this real kind of hybrid 
that they put on, slapped on, printed up a few, who knows how many. Um, but uh, in the 1930s, uh, Jefferson Burdick was the, um, uh, the father of baseball card collecting. Uh, and he was the first one to publish the info that this card was extremely in short supply. People had kind of figured that out. But um, uh, like the Hannes Wagner, um, it, it was you know, uh, an unusual rarity. Yeah. John, someone has handwritten the date 11 14 36. Do we know the significance of that? We do. Um, uh, or we actually, what we know is that uh, this is actually um, uh, Napoleon Lajouet's signature. So he signed it. Uh, and we can only presume that that's the date that he signed it. Somebody uh, met him and said, hey, will you, uh, will you sign my card? Um, and uh, you'll, by the way, uh, you may see some of these uh, on, on eBay uh, that look just like this because people have taken pictures of our card and then reprinted them. Uh, there's nothing to stop anybody from doing that. But if you see one that looks just like this with this date on it, don't think it's original. It's a repro. Yeah. Now, his given name was Napoleon Lajouet. Right. He apparently preferred to go by Larry. That's how he Larry. signed it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And the, uh, and the Cleveland team at the time was called the Naps uh, in honor of him. He was the captain of the team. Uh, and, uh, and so they were called the Cleveland Naps uh, in APS. So a very rare card. We are one of the uh, few collectors right. that has one like this. Uh, in terms of where it is, it's got to be up on the third floor in our newest exhibit, Shoebox Treasures. And I'm guessing it's one of the highlighted Holy Grail cards. That's right, Bruce. That's exactly right. Good. You've been you've been getting up into our exhibits. I'm glad to hear that. Well, these these have been fairly obvious. Don't worry. <laughs> just a few as we go along. So that is Lajue and this very rare Gaudi card from 1933. Now let's take a look at another very different artifact from the Cleveland Indians franchise, a man that I was lucky enough to get to know pretty well because he came here so often, the yeah. late great Bob Feller. And this is one of the baseballs that he used making history April 16th, 1940. Tell us about it. So this was um, uh, Bob Feller's opening day no hitter against the Chicago White Sox. So he, he won one to nothing. Uh, eight strikeout, uh, walked five, and um, uh, he uh, he he actually he donated this um, uh, this baseball to us. Um, now this is one of those things that's really neat, uh, and and it uh, links up with what's happening right now in in baseball history. And some of you may have seen that Major League Baseball has now uh, officially acknowledged the uh, the Negro Leagues from 1920 to 1948 as being major leagues, that these men uh, were major leaguers uh, and that the stats for these are, are counting. I, I put that in the, in the present tense. Uh, it's, um, they're figuring out uh, exactly which games they have and what, you know, what games got played and they still don't have all this, the play-by-play uh, -play -play play and box scores for every game, but this is part of the ever evolving um, nature of, of uh, statistics. So uh, we used to say that uh, Bob Feller pitched the only opening day no, no, no hitter in uh, Major League history. But in uh, 1946, uh, uh, Leon Day, also a Baseball Hall of Famer, uh, threw an opening day no hitter on May the 5th, which was the opening day that year for the Negro National League. Uh, and he beat the Philadelphia Stars two to nothing. And so now we say that um, uh, Bob Feller's uh, victory remains the only opening day no hitter thrown in either the American or National League. So we're changing the, the language on that. Now, this ball, I understand, was donated by Bob Feller 10 years later. Yeah. Um, it looks pretty well worn. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that's because maybe Bob played around with it afterward, or we have to think back to the time period. You know, it was different than today. Today, yeah. A ball is in the dirt, catcher throws it out of play. Uh, right. Any kind of scuff mark is out of play. That was not always the case. I mean, they weren't using one baseball like they would have in the 19th century, but they were not changing the balls as much. And a ball could have gotten scuffed up like this Absolutely. in the process of being used in a 1940 game. That's right. So uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, every ball needs to be pristine 
is really a very new uh, idea from, from the 1990s. Uh, and uh, a lot of it got its, uh, its impetus in 1995 when uh, Major League Baseball relaxed a lot of rules about baseballs going uh, to fans between innings mm. um, and, uh, and also uh, just wanting to, to uh, clean up the game, I suppose, a little bit. But uh, the, the, the baseballs until then really were like, as, as long as it's, you know, nobody throws it out of play, um, we'll just keep on using it. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with this baseball. We would be happy to use it any time in our, uh, in our games. Um, but now we realize that uh, all these little nicks and, and uh, cuts on it and rough spots give a, a pitcher a bigger advantage. So the pitcher is never interested, almost never interested in having a ball tossed out uh, just because it's got a little scuff mark on it. If he knows what he's doing, and, and certainly Bob Feller knew what he was doing, uh, that can give you just a little bit of extra um, uh, grip on that ball. And, and you can make that ball hop a little bit more or curve just a little bit more that uh, you might not be able to do. Uh, John, one of the, what about the typical markings you would see? This is an American League ball. Have they yeah. simply faded away or is just the yeah. ink of the photograph? No, in, in this case, they faded away. The ink is fugitive on uh, on. Uh, on baseballs and uh, uh, there's actually um, uh, on the back side of this ball, there's some lettering from Bob Feller, which talks a little bit about the game, but it, that's almost obliterated as well uh, too. So now one of the things that's kind of fun, uh, Bruce, is that this is not the earliest no hitter in, uh, in, in the season. So it, it was uh, opening day on April the 16th, but um, uh, a number of pitchers have pitched, uh, no hitters earlier than that. And, and today the current earliest no hitter was by uh, Hideo Nomo in, on April the 4th, uh, 2001. I remember it well because I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan and the Boston Red Sox uh, beat the Orioles that, that day, three to, three to nothing. But uh, the thing that's just so great about a, an opening day no hitter is just like, it tells you that the pitcher's coming out a couple of things. One is that the pitcher, the pitcher's uh, ready for the game, ready for the year. Um, but you know, something nowadays, it's really tough to have any pitchers who are going to get nine innings anytime in, in the first month of the season. So, uh, you've really got to have something special going on, but if you're not going to get pulled in the fifth or, or the sixth or seventh inning uh, nowadays, even in the fifth, but. One final question on the ball. Yeah. It looks to me like the seams are a little bit raised. I imagine yeah. you've had, you've, you've worn gloves, but you've had this in your in your hands. Can you tell us about the seams? Yeah, I have uh, worn them and, and definitely there's uh, the seams are, are higher uh, on this ball. I know that uh, MLB is doing some changes to the ball this year. They've announced that they're going to deaden the ball a little bit this year to try to reduce the number of home runs uh, that are being hit. Uh, we'll see how that works, but uh, you know, the seams are what the, the, the pitcher is really able to grab a hold of. And that's what, uh, determines the uh, uh, the friction of the ball as it goes through the air, the drag uh, on the ball, and how the ball is going to respond. So, uh, if uh, at any time the uh, Major League Baseball wants to raise the seams back up on this, uh, once the, fing the the pitchers get a little bit of, of uh, uh, their their finger the fingers toughened up, I think they're going to like that. But I haven't heard anything like that at all. Finally, I'm going to guess that this is up third floor, one for the books. One for the books. It sure is. Okay. Uh, do we still have no hit balls for every no hit game? Uh, we have uh, no hit balls for most single pitcher no hit games. So uh, as you can imagine, there are many, many more no hit games in which multiple pitchers uh, uh, collaborated. Um, yeah. But we have, um, uh, balls from from most uh, most of the no hit uh, games that have ever been pitched. All right, we go pitcher. from a no hitter to uh, well, actually, no, that's coming up next. I was yeah. going to say to a perfect game, but this uh, this is the other Detroit Tigers artifact that we have. Right. This is a very distinctive trophy that was given to Ty Cobb. And it was named for a character known as Honey Boy Evans. What is this about? So George Honey Boy Evans, um, back in the 19 aughts and 19 teens, 
was a uh, well-known, uh, famous, actually, songwriter and performer and baseball fan. You may actually know one of his songs. It's In the Good Old Summertime. Oh. Um, and so he's the kind of a Tin Pan Alley jingle type writer. Um, uh, like I say, he loved, uh, loved baseball. And uh, from 1908 to 1912, uh, he sponsored... Uh, five different trophies, and they all look very different. They're all beautiful. Uh, five different trophies uh, for the player that had player in either league who had the highest batting average. So whoever had the highest batting average in, in all of Major League Baseball would get this trophy. And uh, during this, this time, uh, 1909 to 1912, uh, those four seasons, 9, 10, 11, and 12, uh, Ty Cobb won the, the batting championship all four years in a row. Uh, the year before that, Hannes Wagner won one. Uh, we also have Hannes Wagner's uh, trophy at the Hall of Fame. Uh, so we have every one of the five trophies that were issued uh, at, at the Hall. One of the things I like about this trophy is that it talks about how uh, stats change uh, over time in two different ways. One of them is we get more precise and we have better research and we understand better. As a matter of fact, on this, down at the bottom, you can see there's a... a a baseball uh, that's mounted by an eagle. And on it, it says that um, uh, Cobb's batting average is 417, which is pretty darn good. But it turns out Cobb was even better than that. And he hit 419, we know now, uh, back in 1911. And so that was uh, recalculated based upon going back and doing the day by days, that is looking at every game every day, and making sure that everything added up. And when you did that, you found out, oh, they, they just misadded back uh, in 1911 in time for the 1912 um, uh, day when he was uh, presented with this trophy. So he, uh, he got that. The other thing that I like about it is that uh, talking about the importance of batting average, that was the key stat in a way that like now we look at uh, uh, on base percentage plus slugging. Uh, perhaps as like, if you're going to use one stat to say, how valuable is this player? How much does this player contribute to the game? We might look at uh, on base percentage plus slugging. At that time, it was batting average, batting average, batting average, not on base percentage, batting average. And so when uh, uh, Ty Cobb hits 419, you know, that's still just amazing. And he was, uh, by the way, there were a lot of, of, high batting averages at the time, but nothing like 419. So he's, he's, he's way above everybody. Very interesting. So the mistake was not made by the trophy maker. It was uh, a, ca a miscalculation by Major League Baseball. Misca and well, in, in this case, uh, you know, Major League Baseball uh, barely existed as an entity at the time. We had something called the National Commission, uh, which was, you know, three guys in a room uh, uh, who would decide these things. Um, but uh, but Honey Boy Evans, who knows where Honey Boy got his uh, got his numbers from? Could have been from the Spalding Guide. Maybe the yeah. Spalding Guide got it wrong. We don't. I don't know where the uh, where the numbers came from that he used. Um, but the the fact of the matter is he he did have that number wrong. But uh, but Ty Cobb made it all right with uh, yeah. with with all of his hits. John, what's the material used in making this? This is uh, you know th th this has silver in it, but I don't know uh, what the rest of the material is, Bruce. I think it's a, I think it's mostly brass okay. uh, with, uh, with some silver highlights to it. And have you ever picked it up? Heavy. Is it heavy? Okay. Heavy. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Cobb gave it to the hall of fame. It was a donation. Yes. Now, as far as where it is, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I'm, it's too late for the 19th century room. I'm going to, I'm going to guess it's in the timeline of baseball history. I really don't know. No, you, that would be a good guess, but we actually have it up in uh, one for the books where it talks about um, uh, Ty Cobb as a, as a great batter. All right. So if you come to the museum, you'll see the Honey Boy Trophy uh, third floor in one for the books. Yeah. We, uh, I will tell you, we also have uh, a couple in or one or two. We have two in that spot that you were talking about in the um, in the timeline. So you're right that we have some in the timeline, uh, but we don't happen to have this particular one in the timeline. So I, I get to score a point.
Yeah, and they're and you said they're all different. The designs are not the same. That's right. From one trophy to the other. All right, let's um let's go to the game that could have been and should have been a perfect game, but it was not. Right. The Armando Galarraga game from June second, two thousand ten. Don't often highlight bases in the collection, but this plays a huge part in this story, John. Right. So uh, this was the uh, the infamous imperfect perfect game that uh, Armando Galarraga pitched uh, back in 2010 against the uh, against Cleveland. Uh, he mowed down uh, Cleveland's first 26 batters. Uh, 13 of them were on ground balls, so uh, kept the infield happy, sharing the um, uh, you know sharing the burden. Uh, 26 batter grounded to the right side. Um, uh, Miguel Cabrera uh, fielded it and then turned to Galarraga, uh, who was covering first, pitched it to Galarraga, got him out, and uh, all the t- Tigers fielders start jumping for joy and running off the field because it was a close play, but not that close a play. But, uh, but Jim Joyce froze them all when he called him safe. And, uh, you know, uh, I will say that, that uh, Cabrera's look on his face is just like, he can't believe it. He can't, uh, he's never seen anything like it before. And, uh, you know, there's no, as a matter of fact, and this is why we picked this artifact, there was no instant replay at the time. There was no way that you could go back and double check and see if, if what you thought you saw is what you saw. And uh, this was the bag that, um, uh, that Galarraga touched with his foot, the, the, uh, the first base bag. Um, and, uh, and the replays clearly showed as the first play does that he beats it by a half a step. Uh, the, the, the ball beats the player there by a half a step. Uh, the thing that is also interesting is that, uh, Jim Joyce, um, when, as soon as the game was over, he went back and watched it on TV saw the replay and immediately went to the locker room of Galarraga to tell him I messed up. Yeah. I booted the call. And then he went, uh, he went to the press uh, and, and in the press conference said the same thing. He said it was the most important call of my career, which is saying a lot because he was a, a world series umpire many times. He said, it's the most important call of my career and I booted it. And I, I took a perfect game away from this guy. So um we obtained it because we thought that this might be an artifact that would help um, boost the idea that was going around by 19, by 2010, that uh, instant replay might be something that was on the horizon. And and in fact, this was uh, a major impetus because it was clear that you could have, had it been available, looked at it, challenged it, uh, whatever, and gotten the call right there on the field. Um, This wouldn't have taken four minutes to, uh, to look at it. And my own feeling about instant replay is if it's, uh, if it takes you more than 30 seconds to figure out whether or not the, uh, the call was right or not, then there's inconclusive, there's not enough evidence to, uh, to overrule the umpire. I was like, give the, give that responsibility back to the umpires. Um, anyway, that's the story on that. That's a, it's a, a great story and, uh, and it's, uh, imperfection, um, it demonstrates uh, perfectly uh, that that baseball is a game of humans and of human error. As you say, uh, Joyce uh, handled it beautifully. He admitted that he'd made a mistake. He didn't try to cover, didn't make any excuses. And I think people respected that. And as I recall, Galarraga was very graceful about it, too. He, yeah, he was. could have been upset. And, uh, you know, when he did interviews, he, he really, you know, kind of looked at it philosophically and did not, uh, he did not roast uh, Joyce at all. Yeah. He said that, you know, everybody makes mistakes and that was what, uh, and Joyce did. So yeah. there you go. What can you, what can you say? Now, uh, as far as, as where this base is, this is another one where I really am not sure. I mean, I guess it could go up in one for the books, even though it's not a perfect game. Um, like it's recent enough, maybe that it could be in the Tigers' locker. I'm going to go one for the books. I don't know. You're right. It is in one for the books, and we we use it to talk about uh, about perfect games and what a perfect game is. And um, in a lot of ways, because uh, you know, uh, Galarraga got the very next guy out, so you know he he had um, 
uh, you know, the, he lost the perfect game and he lost the no hitter because the the hit the the, the ball was ruled a hit. Um, yeah, uh, it wasn't an error. Uh, uh, and um, but the very next guy came out. So in in a, in a very real way, um, uh, Galarraga got twenty eight outs in a twenty seven out game. Yeah, you were telling me in an email who the Indians batter was. Nobody ever says that. It's an obscure player named Jason Donald. Yeah. And he got the one hit, credited with the one hit in the almost perfect game for Galarraga. Right. All right, we'll go now to the uh, Kansas City Royals. And uh, this is maybe the most controversial of all the artifacts because the moment itself was controversial. Yeah. July 24th, 1983, Kansas City Royals third baseman and Hall of Famer, George Brett, used this bat to hit a home run to defeat the New York Yankees. And then Billy Martin, the manager of the Yankees came out and protested. I was actually watching this on WPIX television. We'll never forget it. We'll never forget the reactions. But tell us a little bit more about the pine tar bat, if you will, John. Right, so um, the uh, uh, George Brett in the the ninth inning uh, in Yankee Stadium uh, hits a, a two out, two run homer to give the Royals the lead. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but Billy Martin, who like, uh, a f- like few other managers have before or since knew the rule book inside and out, and more importantly, knew how to wield the uh, rule book as a bludgeon, as a weapon, if you needed to. And he did. And so he knew that there was a rule that said you could not have any, uh, foreign substance on the bat beyond 18 inches. And so, uh, the the pine tar, and if you watch, you you can't tell from this photo because after the pine tar game, George Brett cleaned the, the pine tar down and reapplied it so it didn't go back past the, the 18 inches, continued to use the bat until it broke uh, because it was a favorite bat of his. And, you know, any bat that, beat, that beats the, um, the Yankees for George Brett was a good bat. Uh, but so the uh, Billy Martin goes and says, this is an illegal bat. You've got to disallow it. And uh, the umpires not only disallowed it, they called George Brett out. They threw the bat out uh, and uh, pulled the home run back off the scoreboard. The um, uh, Yankees went on to win the game until under appeal, um, the uh, the league president, Lee McPhail, said that the game should be won and lost on the playing field, not through technicalities and the rules. And so he said the next time the, the Royals are in Yankee Stadium, we're going to start this game counting the home run at the exact moment that, that George Brett's home run was uh, landed. And so uh, they ended up going on to win uh, the uh, uh, win that game. Um, but uh, that was uh, 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 that on-field decision overturned um, uh, is one of the very rare times that a league president has reached into a game uh, to make that change. It was uh, actually one of the things that uh, people who said that Galarraga's game should be uh, corrected uh, pointed to to um, uh, Commissioner Bud Selig to say, look, uh, there's a precedent here. Lee McPhail reached into a game and, and fixed it uh, so that it was played the way it was supposed to be played. Um, but uh, certainly uh, one of the great times, George Brett talks about it uh, all the time. He says that when he was uh, when he would be at home, his kids would say, daddy, daddy, put the tape in where you go crazy. (laughs) And so, so it's a, it's rampage towards the umpire. He was not thrown out uh, because well, the game was over at that point or they thought it was over. Yeah. And when they replayed or they, they continued, they picked up from that moment, I guess it was about a month later in mid to late August. Rhett was in the replay part of the game. So he was not yeah. ejected despite the rampage. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Which is he, you know, uh, uh, he did not, if, although you can, when you read his lips and it's not difficult to do that, uh, he never, as, as um, uh, Doug Harvey once said, the minute you put the word you in front of any of those words, that's going to get you ejected. <laughs> but, but fortunately for the Royals, uh, George Brett didn't say you in front of any of those things that he said. So uh, so he didn't get tossed. 
You know, it's it's a fascinating play, and it can be analyzed endlessly. I, I'll just make one more point, and that is that according to the rule book, the written rules of the day, they didn't specify what the punishment should be for the hitter, whether the hitter right. should be called out. What there was was a precedent. It happened, I think, a couple of years earlier. Thurman Munson had been found to have used an illegal bat. And uh, he was called out. And I think either the Yankees, uh, I think they didn't protest that decision. So according to the precedent, um, the batter would have been out. But the rule book was a little vaguer on the subject. And that, I guess, gave Lee McPhail, the American League president, enough wiggle room to offer his own interpretation. John, there's some interesting writing between the Louisville Slugger label and the Brett facsimile signature. Do you know what that's all about? That it, that says this is the pine tar bat uh, from the date, and it, it just gives it uh, gives the particulars um, very briefly about the bat. But just to um, you know, to even us at the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, after a while, bats and balls start to look alike, even when you know what they are. Yeah. Uh, and so this was uh, later on, uh, and it's in George Brett's hand, and it, it describes this is what this bat is, the significance of the bat. And it, this is um, uh, unique among the artifacts, Bruce, that, uh, that I'm showing you. This is the only one that's not uh, in our collection uh, as an accessioned item property of the Baseball Hall of Fame. This one has been loaned for many, many years now by the Brett family. We're very thankful for them for doing that. They're very generous and gracious to allow us to show it, and, and we appreciate that. But this has been uh, on a long time uh, loaned to us, and uh, we hope to be able to show it for a, a long time more. So it is on loan, but it is currently on exhibit. It has been for a number of years. Pretty sure this is up in a whole new ball game yeah. because I've seen the video replay of, uh, of the entire play and the Brett, the Brett charge of home plate. Uh, so I'm guessing it's up in, in that area. That's right. That's exactly where it is. All right. So it is in a whole new ball game, baseball from 1970 to the current day. And that's second floor of the museum. Our other Kansas City Royal related artifact is this rather large catcher's mitt belonging to the Royals catcher, Salvador Perez. And this comes to us from the World Series 2015. Tell us more, if you will, John. So um, uh, Sal Perez uh, was a really uh, a star in this. And, and you know that he was because he was uh, named the World Series MVP. Uh, for his uh, work both at the plate. So he got uh, eight hits and a 364 batting average, which topped all the season regulars. Uh, but then at the uh, on defense, um, he was uh, flawless pretty much. And, and uh, his excellent pitch selection kept the Mets batters off balance. Uh, the Mets came in as a strong hitting team, uh, but uh, they did not uh, perform so well uh, during the, the, the series. Um, and uh, so, and so he earned the the MVP award uh, a lot because uh, it was recognized that he just had called a masterful game uh, or five masterful games um, uh, to to win this World Series. I think one of the things that's really uh, neat was that during this time uh, he set a record for the most innings caught, major league record for the most innings caught over a two year period. Uh, he caught over twenty seven hundred innings. Um, uh, breaking a, a mark that was set back in the late 1960s by uh, Randy Hunley of the Cubs. Wow. Um, and, and he also threw in a, a, a postseason tour of Japan in between uh, 2014 and, and 15. So um, uh, doing a, quite a lot of catching. Um, but uh, he was, uh, you know, the thing that's really neat is that pitchers really wanted him catching. Uh, there is a, a something that happens very often nowadays and that there's uh, one pitcher who likes one catcher more than he likes the regular catcher. And so you'll often see, um, uh, you know, that somebody's designated catcher. So sometimes it's the term that's used. Uh, but he was, uh, Perez was the designated catcher for all of the, the uh, Royals pitchers. Uh, they really liked him. Uh, and uh, just a great, uh, great story. He was a unanimous um, uh, World Series uh, MVP. Uh, in, in game five, he had the uh, 
RBI that tied the game in the ninth when Eric Hosmer scored on a sliding play at the plate. Um, and then he started the 12th, 12th inning rally uh, that game five that won the World Series. So uh, a lot going on both sides of the plate, both offensively and defensively. John, you mentioned in your notes to me earlier that when he first came up, some people were skeptical skeptical about him being a catcher because of his size. Yeah. He's about 6'4", probably 200 plus pounds. Most catchers are not that tall, not that big. Yeah, it takes, you know, um, a few have been, but they're sort of noteworthy. Uh, Carlton Fisk was also a big guy. But, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of catchers who, who just uh, uh, can't get down low enough and, and can't stay flexible enough and, uh, uh, you know, take, just take too long to, to pop the ball from, from the, from the mitt to the second baseman. Um, but, uh, but Perez, uh, you know, big man was able to block a lot of balls and, uh, had a terrific arm, uh, and just amazing quickness. So, uh, really, a, a remarkable all around, uh, all around player, uh, playing both, both sides of the ball. Yeah. He missed this past season because of injury, but scheduled to come back in yeah. 2021. So we'll look forward to him coming back all uh, nice and healthy and rested and tanned and all of that. I, I'm, I'm hopeful for him. I, I, I love durable catchers. I, it's a <laughs> it's a tough position to play. I love the color of this glove, too. You don't see this black. You see brown most of the time. Yeah. Sometimes you see lighter colors, but uh, just very distinctive. Uh, the black glove, and you can see the Rawlings uh, insignia on the lower left side. All right, John, we've got uh, one more team to examine two artifacts. Uh, right. Actually, wait, let's, I didn't, I did not uh, guess where oh. this is. Uh, the Salvador Perez glove, where are the mitt, where could this be? I'm going to say it's in the Royals locker, maybe. You would almost be correct. It's in the uh, 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 Autumn Glory. This is the uh, item that relates to the, um, uh, to the Royals' victory, we try to um, to have an item from the most recent years, anyway, uh, in in our little timeline there in Autumn Glory, and that's where this is. All right, very good. Okay, our final team now, Minnesota yeah. Twins. Here's something a little bit different. Uh, this is uh, a piece of cloth, the yeah. famed Homer Hanky for the Minnesota Twins during their championship run in 1987. Uh, good backstory on this one. Yeah. So this was uh, inspired by um, Pittsburgh's terrible towels. If you watch the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, play and uh, there was a, a young woman promotions manager named Terry Robbins, who uh, worked for the uh, Minneapolis Star Tribune newspaper in uh, in the Twin Cities. And she had this idea to uh, as a as a giveaway promotion slash uh, way of, of boosting circulation as well in that um, what you would do is, is uh, uh, that the idea was they gave away about 60,000 of these uh, uh, out of a, an original print produce a print run of, of 200,000. And then the remainder were sold for a dollar uh, at, at the twins and at the uh, Star Tribune or for 50 cents if you bought a, a quarter newspaper. So, you know, if you get the coupon out, then you'd be able to save yourself a quarter. So, but uh, anyway, it, it really capitalized on the, uh, on the twins um, for the first time in 20 years since um, uh, 1965 uh, World Series. Uh, they were in the, in the postseason and uh, they actually had to print these up ahead of time and hope that the twins were going to make it. Uh, and they did. Uh, but people loved them. They were lined up around the block to buy them. Um, and as a matter of fact, the, the original print run of, of 200,000 uh, ended up being 2.3 million. Mm. That's how many uh, of this, this particular year, Homer Hankies, uh, were given away. And it, so it continued um, in the beginning of the postseason, continued through all three, uh, two or three levels of the postseason at the time finished in the World Series, and uh, against the Cardinals, if you've seen any of those Metrodome shots, the, the sign uh, you know, of the, the twirling white handkerchiefs right. is just an iconic element, again, four years later as well. Um, uh, but just 
the it was the first time that the home team in a World Series had won every game, and uh, a lot of the Twins uh, credited the fans and the uh, and the Homer Hankies for really charging up uh, the atmosphere in a dome where uh, you needed a little bit of extra to uh, to really get it rocking. Yeah, how did we get this item? It was donated to us, and I don't remember. Uh, I don't have right here who. Oh, wait a minute. I might. Let me check. I've got a couple of documents uh, next to me here. Let's see if, if I've got any information here about this particular one. While you're looking, just point out if, if people look carefully in the lower left hand corner, they'll actually see copyright 1987 Star Tribune 34 years ago, even though it doesn't seem that long. Um, so uh, it looks actually like it looks like we it was uh, picked up. Uh, we ordinarily will have um, a staff member, a couple of staff members, go to World Series, yeah. and uh, uh, it was it it was an, an in, what we call an internal transfer, which means that somebody from the Hall of Fame picked it up and just uh, sent it over to um, uh, to our accessions committee. Uh, that's the group of us who meet and decide whether to accept something. So this was an internal transfer from uh, from the Baseball Hall of Fame to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Nice. Uh, I'm going to guess this is up uh, third floor sacred ground or celebration of ballparks. Yeah. It's, oh, uh, no. Uh, third floor, but also in the World Series room. Oh, it's in, the uh, in, in Autumn Glory. Oh, OK. So quite a, few, quite a few Autumn Glory items here. Very good. All right. Our last item of the day from the Minnesota Twins. Here's a pitcher who's already somewhat forgotten, and he was such a dominant pitcher not that long ago. Johan Santana wore this jersey 2006 right. when he accomplished a pitching rarity. Yeah. Uh, so that year, uh, he won pitching's triple crown. Uh, so he uh, led, but not just to win the, the, the triple crown, you have to lead your league in uh, wins, ERA, and strikeouts. But um, Santana was so dominant that year that he led the major leagues, both leagues, in wins, ERA, and strikeouts. And he, he capped the year by being unanimously named the uh, Cy Young Award winner. Uh, just uh, a, an amazing uh, uh, performance uh, that year. Um, he had uh, str 10 straight seasons with a winning record. Uh, he was totally dominant from like 2003 to 2008, One, uh, a great example of a, uh, of a very brightly burning uh, ball player who doesn't have a really long career. He had only 12 years in the majors um, uh, before his, his, basically his body uh, gave up uh, on him. That, that particular year, just to give folks a little feeling for it, how good he was, he was uh, 19 and six with uh, a 2.77 ERA he had uh, 245 strikeouts that year in 233 innings pitched. Uh, so he was averaging more than a strikeout an inning. Um, uh, it was his second uh, Cy Young Award. Both of them were unanimous. Uh, and the only three pitchers, other pitchers who've ever done that in Major League history were Pedro Martinez, Roger Clemens, and Greg Maddox. Wow. So really, I think that's one of those things that uh, tells you how how bright he was, how good he was. Um, he had a, a streak of, of um, from 2005 to 2007 when the Twins went 24 and 0 at home when he started. Uh, and so just, you know, he was unstoppable at home and barely stoppable on the road. Uh, that particular year, he went 10 and 1 uh, in 15 starts after the all-star break. So there's, there was no, uh, no slow down in him. There was no, uh, Oh, I'm getting a little bit tired. Uh, you know, he gets 15 more starts after the all-star break, which means he was taking his turn every single time, yeah. but a, uh, a shoulder capsule injury and a torn Achilles, Achilles tendon, uh, ended his career, um, and, uh, and took him from us as a player prematurely. Yeah. Those first six years, he seemed to be on a beeline for the Hall of Fame. But he really uh, did, yeah. Can go quickly for pitchers, especially. Uh, interesting. Uh, it's a Twins home pinstripe uniform from '06. Uh, you see the left sleeve. There's yeah. the Minnesota Twins logo with the the two twin brothers, and then on the other sleeve, the 34 for Kirby Puckett, as I recall. Right. That's right. He had just died. Uh, and so the 34 was being worn in memorial, a uh, memorial tribute uh, to Kirby Puckett. 
um, a beautiful, beautiful uh, uniform and uh, representative of a, a great young pitcher at the peak of his career. Uh, so that completes our 10 artifacts for the five teams in the American League uh, Central. Uh, John, as, as always, we thank you for your contributions. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to do another one of these programs. It'll be the National League Central with uh, Gabrielle Augustine from your curatorial department. So we do look forward to that. But uh, hey, we appreciate your time. Great insights. Great. Thanks very much. And then I'll come back after uh, Gabrielle and we'll talk about the American League West. Uh, got a few uh, uh, neat items up my sleeve that I look forward to uh, to bring it out to our, our West Coast fans and um, uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Excellent. We thank you, John. Uh, we also want to thank the Ford Motor Company for their generous support of this and other programs that we are offering throughout 2021. Generous support uh, that comes our way from the Ford Motor Company. Uh, you, also Ford. want to remind folks our next program that is coming up is this week, this Thursday, February the 11th. And it's a program that we do with the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration, CILC. Um, you can actually register for the program if you go to our website and go to our events calendar. And it is a program that we're able to offer free of charge because of the folks at CILC. And it's our educational unit on cultural diversity. So that's coming up in just a couple of days, Thursday, February 11th, and that's 1 p.m. Eastern time. Our thanks to John, our thanks to all of our viewers, and of course, the Ford Motor Company. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.